I would always ask him a question. Uh, what was the hardest thing for your business? And they'd all would say, you know, just to talk about it, it's not always roses when it comes to entrepreneurship. Yeah, it's a living, breathing uh, thing, a business, right? And what worked before is not going to be working, say, five years from now. Greg Lang, American entrepreneur, restaurateur, philanthropist, and businessman, runs a restaurant empire in Thailand consisting of 12 subway outlets and 14 Mexican food restaurants. Greg is not only known for his successful restaurant chain, Sunrise Tacos, but also his charity work in Bangkok with Bangkok Community Help Foundation. Introducing Greg Lang. I think as far as for a foreigner being involved here, you know, the governments, they just went there. And then I said, okay, let me just go ahead and develop this myself. Okay. And that's how it worked. It's the right thing to do, right? Over 70% of the people watching this video are not subscribed to the channel. If you could please take a moment to subscribe, it would really help us out. Greg. Hi. You're originally from Nebraska and grew up in Florida, USA. Yes. How long were you in Nebraska? Oh, about 19 years. 19 I was years, born okay. There. So if you never came to Thailand and entered the restaurant business, what would you be doing? What was your dream job as, you know, a kid in Nebraska? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I think I wanted to be a fireman or a lawyer, I think. You okay. know, you go through uh -huh. different phases, All right. right? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I know at one phase I wanted to be a fireman, and then fireman. another phase was a lawyer. All know? right. Fireman and lawyer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is a big jump. And then as then you moved to Florida, how did your life change? What, what were you planning to do then? Well, at that time, I was just, I love Florida so much, right? It's not cold. And uh, there are a lot of advantages. And I just wanted to find a way to uh, live there. Okay. You know? And it's pretty close to what a lot of expats, when they move here, they really love Thailand and they just want to stay here, yeah. right? They want to just survive, you know, okay. and have money. So I'm just a 19-year-old uh, kid out of college, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to uh, live there. And I got into the restaurant business because that's usually one of the yeah. easiest ways to so like, uh, make money. But I was working in a kitchen, okay. right? All right. I started out as a dishwasher. Okay. Yeah. So then... Uh, Dish moved up wash. to the salad bar, and then I became an expediter. Okay. And uh, then uh, the next step was being a broker. I was a business broker for yes. uh, Sunbelt. Mm -hmm. That's the world's largest business brokerage where they have a lot of uh, different uh, 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 offices, brings the buyers and sellers of businesses together. Mm -hmm. And I uh, did that for a long time. And... Uh, yeah, one day I went on a holiday yeah. to, uh, just like how I ended up in Florida, I went on holiday to Thailand. And I love Thailand so much that I wanted to live here, All right. you know? <laughs> yeah. And so the natural thing was yeah. to, because I already knew about Sunbelt, was I approached them. And, uh, you know, like a lot of Americans, they don't know their geography. So when I went to purchase, they had it mixed up with Taiwan, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> And they were looking at the yeah. numbers, you know, like how Thailand. much it was going to cost, yeah. co you know, cost me, mm. you know. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, that's how I got in. We'll, we'll get into more about uh, that that part and that biz that part of your life. Yeah. Um, before we get started, I want to ask you, how do you feel coming from Nebraska when Thai people tell you they're feeling cold? <laughs> you know, stumped. You know, I mean, you know, you know, real cold. Nebraska gets like proper cold. Yeah, it does. You know, uh, I've lived in warm weather so much in my life that, uh, well, you know, it's You've almost forty-five years, okay. right? Forty-five years yeah. of hot weather. That thank God I forgot the uh, cold weather, right? <laughs> you know, so when yeah. they when they talk a little bit about cold, I probably yeah, my blood is a little bit cold then too. You know, mm -hmm. like yeah, it is a little bit nippy. You know, so maybe I've adapted <laughs> more like that. Yeah. So you arrived in Thailand around two thousand one. Yes, you, 
I know you came here initially for a holiday, but why Thailand? I mean, coming from America, like, how did you even find out that there's this, you know, great country in Southeast Asia that I want to go to? Like, are, are there flyers during that time? Or you heard great stories? Well, I heard great stories about, uh, you One know, it was a place to visit. Yeah, right. All right. No, it was a uh, great place to mm -hmm. uh, do. You know, I had a lot of friends uh, uh, on the Internet. And, you know, there was forums and stuff. And, uh, you know, you'd start talking to uh, guys and stuff. And uh, we planned on having a Thanksgiving dinner at uh, Bourbon Street. Okay. So in this, Ikemai, you mean? Yeah. Okay. But, no, this would have been more what, before they got it torn down at Soy 22, oh, okay. right? right? Okay. And I'm trying to remember the year. It would have been... It was right around when the crisis was, as far as that. So it would have been probably around 1997, 1998. Okay. Yeah. That we had that first uh, Thanksgiving. And then we had it for like five or six years. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a reunion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, has the Tiger, uh, as far as the members, have you had a party yet? Yes, we have. Oh, okay. So it's great, you know, to meet all the people that, that, uh, you know, talking, you know, and you're putting a face to the to the people, so. Well, believe it or not, we had it at Margarita Storm. Oh. You were there. Okay. Remember? <laughs> yeah, but that's that wasn't that many members. Yes. So th I know th that you're huge, right? Oh, yes. so, so those those were, uh, that was limited to very few people. Right. Uh, as in, it was the members within the members. So we have subscribers, and then we have uh, Tiger members who actually support the channel. So that right. was the, the first time we ever did it. We should do more of a public one. Oh, yes, Have we will. a wild party. So this end of this year, we'll, we're going to have a wild one, and I think a lot of people will show yeah. up. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, maybe a thousand. So, so coming to coming to Thailand initially, how was setting up a business in Thailand as an American? Because I know at 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 that time, um, American citizens had it maybe a bit easier or or special. Well, they still do. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, under the Amity Treaty where you're able to own a business a hundred percent. Okay. And. Uh, yeah, I definitely did that. I took advantage of it. Okay. You know. So, but you still had the same requirements, right? Yeah. As far as forming the company and all that, mm -hmm. right? And and you were always into the business brokerage company before before you yeah. came to Thailand and even after you came to Thailand, initially that was your first uh uh entrepreneurship and 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 uh, business venture in Thailand. Right. So you, when you initially started in Bangkok uh, and you set up your brokerage company, uh, Subway was one of your client. Is that correct? Right. So one of the things is is a, uh, a natural uh, manager or owner is uh, someone that are, you know, around 45, 50 years old and has been in charge of 20, 30 people, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, they decide to do something else. And so they want to get into a business. And so the best thing is a franchise because these people are used to getting, you know, instructions, right? And so they're not ready to be their own boss, per se, but to get direction. And so franchisers really like these type of people. So when the best way is to talk to a business broker that identifies people like this. And so we had put an ad in the Bangkok Post at that time. This is when newspapers mm -hmm. were still yeah. predominant. And we had 365 applications. But uh, there was only three at the end of the day that said, yeah, I want to do it after they filled out you know, all the details. And those were not, uh, those people were not really uh, the proper fit, you know, because it, it has to be both ways. It's not just the franchisee wanting to do it. The franchisor has to accept them as well. Okay. And uh, so that's how I got into Subway, mm -hmm. you know, at that time. And then... You got to a point where you basically thought to yourself that, okay, I've, you know, 360 plus people have applied. Right. There's only three that are basically serious candidates. Right. I could do this. And possibly I might well, be actually, the best they candidate. Were and they were actually turned down. Okay. Right? All so right. we were at uh, stage zero. Okay. But unbeknownst to me, Subway had uh, found uh, a uh, another gentleman on their own, a... He used to sell life insurance, and uh, he wanted to move to Thailand 
and uh, do Subway. And so he became the development agent because he was the first one. We opened three days later, but I didn't even know that it was a race oh, per okay. se. Okay. You know, it just ha but it worked out really well uh, because then he spent so much time being a development agent that he didn't really have time to expand. Okay. While our group expanded a great deal to 14 locations. Yeah, and he, all of them was from that first store, There's the profits. We never went into our pockets to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, to expand the business, yeah, right? Yeah. And so everything grew upon itself. Okay. How many branches of Subways do you still uh, have? 14. 14, 14 so locations, okay. right. So I'm, a, I'm like an investor. I'm the majority shareholder, but I don't get involved okay. very, very... You know, I just know a little bit, yeah. you know, okay. about Subway, you know. So I, I've got it down here as, you know, Greg Lang, CEO and founder of Sunrise Tacos. That's how I uh, right. first, uh, no, actually, that's not how I first knew you, but that that's maybe what you're really known for, Sunrise Tacos. Right. And you also have Margarita Storm, and uh, I recently found out that you also have uh, these 12 Subways. So... Why did you decide, you know, from Subway? Subway is, okay, like, you know, it's Thailand. It's it's like sandwiches. People love sandwiches. We get that. But, like, Sunrise Tacos, why did you think that Mexican food would work in Thailand? So, you know, the rents are really high here. And so a lot of times you do a co-branding mm -hmm. where, you know, if the rent is 300000 it's very hard to overcome that by just selling sandwiches, right? Yeah. So you co-brand it with a coffee brand or a pizza brand or something, right? And so we had a, quite a number of uh, different restaurants, not only just Subway at that time. And uh, a number of my friends said, hey, done everything. Why don't you do... Uh, something like Mexican. Isn't that the first thing that you do when you get back home? And I said, yeah. Yeah, I really miss Mexican. And so then I researched it, and I've, I'm a firm believer in franchising, but nobody at that time mm -hmm. was interested in franchising. I did fly out to Las Vegas. There was a company called Taco Time, but I was not really impressed. And it was quite expensive just for one location. And then I said, okay, let me just go ahead and develop this myself. Okay. And that's how it worked. Nice. Yeah. And how many Sunrise Tacos are there now? Uh, Eleven. Eleven. Counting Margarita Storm. Okay. Right? Counting Margarita Storm. Wow. So you have a little bit of a restaurant business empire on your hands. Yeah. You know, it just uh, leads upon itself. Uh, when I was in... Uh, you know, Florida, mm -hmm. I was in the restaurant business, and so I enjoyed it, okay. right? And uh, one of the things when you're in the business brokerage, you really are selling a lot of restaurants, right? Yeah. And it's the number one thing that, uh, especially in uh, Fort Lauderdale, where I lived, uh, the highest per capita number of restaurants per the population was in that area because so many people from the north would come down to, and want to live in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton, right? Yeah. And so what do people always know? They know food, right? Yeah. And so that's what they wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing as far as uh, kind of like Bangkok, right? Mm -hmm. People that are expats, they want to come here. What do they know? They know food. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very similar, not only the weather in Florida, but also the the, the weather and the, the, pe the expats, you mm -hmm. know, the mentality. Okay. You know, because not too many people come here and start a factory, you know. There are some. We've, yeah. uh, we did some factories. But uh, for the most part, everybody relates to food, right? Yeah. And, uh, but it's not easy, is it, you know? And there's a lot of failures. Seventy percent of uh, restaurants fail in the first two years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the restaurant business, especially in Bangkok, I mean, yeah. it's a extremely difficult to to run a successful one but you right. not only it's not only having those you know 14 branches but um um you, you've run it consistently for quite so many years right would you say that's because of the brand or is it just because for example mexican food just kind of goes well with Thai people. Do you rely on the tourists that come into Thailand and want to try the Mexican food, or is it more the locals? I think that any successful restaurant here started out where they catered a little bit to the expats because they knew. And then the Thais, they see that it's successful. They want to try. Okay. Yeah. 
I, any brand that I've seen that really took off usually had the influence of the expats at first, and then tries, ties will definitely try. Okay. And you can't base your business on just expats, especially, say, during uh, COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Or there's always going to be something happening every year, yeah. right? There's going to be a downtick in tourism. It's the local expat and ties is where your money is. And so when I, you know, lately we've been visiting a lot of schools and that, and uh, you're treated like a rock star, you mm -hmm. know, the, the young kids or the, the teenagers, when they mention uh, the name Sunrise Tacos, you know, they, they get quite excited, right? And yeah. so that feels really, really good, right? That yeah. people really understand our brand, right? No, absolutely, yeah. So that's the passion of being an owner, yeah. you know, and why you always want to improve and always, you know, looking to see new ways that you can do so. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree with you in the fact that you successfully created a brand that really resonated with a younger audience as well because I knew about Sunrise Tacos when I was in university. Right. And, you know, it would it, it would be like a little bit of a treat because I used to, my university was outside of Bangkok, so I travel in. Right. And when I'm in the city, I'm like, okay, now right. I get to go to these restaurants and I would have Sunrise Tacos and I was psyched when I met you. I was like, wait, you own Sunrise Tacos? That's exactly how some of these kids are. They're like, oh, can I touch you? You know, <laughs> it's like, wow, you know, it's make you know, yeah, it's fantastic because yeah. I represent the brand, right? And, and I grew yeah. up with this yeah. brand, so I'm like, yeah. I see it, and yeah. I, and I've tasted it, and I've known it consistently for years, and then you meet that guy, like, right. whoa, that guy owns Sunrise Tacos. Yeah. Uh, the other day they had the uh, affair. Uh, restaurants and yeah. that you know uh at the new queen circuit yeah. thing and there were so many people that came up to me i happened to be with free soap and he was like yeah, yeah do you know all these people <laughs> yeah but not yeah. really some of them yeah. we did right but when they saw that you know sunrise tacos they uh really got excited you know so but, it, it, it's yeah. it's great you know i just want to take a moment to explain like for those of you watching maybe from us or uk like it for me, it was the equivalent of meeting, you know, if you're in the U.S., like the owner of Taco Bell, or if you're in the U.K., the owner of Nando's, you know, how you would feel. Well, I really like Nando's. Nando's is I very love nice. Nando's. Yeah, yeah, Nando's yeah. is good. My wife, Amy, really loves uh, uh, Nando's as well. Okay. Yeah, it's, I wish that the proper Nando's was yeah. here. You know? well, yeah. Yeah, they have Don't a you? lot in the Middle East. Yeah. So you have possibly the best pumpkin pie, I would say, in Thailand. Could you do us all a favor and share the secret recipe with me right now? Well, it's not made out of a can. It's okay. uh, made out of uh, a real pumpkin. Really? Yeah. Is that the secret? I think that's really the secret. Is uh, And the there's a certain... I'm not going to give you the, the whole secret. Oh. But, but all right. Thai pumpkin is quite good. I'll just okay. leave it like that. Okay. You don't need a USA pumpkin. Okay. But, uh, you know, the Thai pumpkin is sweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a certain thing that people can uh, relate to. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, coming up, we sell more pumpkin pies or actual all pies during the holidays. Uh, it's around 4,000 whole pies we will make wow. in about 60-day period. And so... Yeah, that's humming. Because uh, pies is what you know foreigners can relate to yeah. around that time of year. Yeah. It's just one of those things. There's not a lot of pies around here. Yeah, true. We sell our pies, in fact, at some of the villas, oh, supermarkets. Okay. Cool. So. What would you say are the biggest difficulties of running a restaurant business in Thailand? I mean, why do you, I think that some of them fail and that? Yes. But is it more of, you know, there's a lot of fads. I guess, like, people just lose interest. Everybody goes for a couple of months because that's something your friend's talking right. about. And then they die out within three to six months. Like, why do so many of them fail? You know, some people just have bad luck. Okay. It's just a mad bojo at that particular location. People come and go. And there's certain, you know, whenever you see a new place coming in, 
you know that it's not going to last because mm -hmm. everything else has failed, right? Uh, but there are some that have gone into those mad mojos and they were successful, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to know why it, it's something that people really wanted, right? But uh, the management stayed focused, right? I think that there's a certain thing that you're talking more about where people get bored or they, you know, it becomes mm -hmm. a fad. But I think also people or the owners don't stay motivated. They don't, okay. you know, not always uh, have their eyes on the ball, right? Okay. Uh, Is it easy to... I mean, when you start, the ball? when you first start out, right, yeah. you're all motivated. It's just like going to the first day in job, right? You know, you, or New Year's, New Year's resolution. I'm going to do this. I'm mm -hmm. going to, you know. Yeah. And then that's kind of like after a certain time period because it's so much work involved. Mm -hmm. You know, there's 16 day out, 16 hour days, uh, and it's every day. And your relationship of your loved ones suffer because of it because that's all you can yeah. focus on, right? Okay. So you have to really love the restaurant business at first. I mean, after a certain time period and you've got your staff in place, then you can kind of like back off. But you still, yeah, it's a living, breathing uh, thing, a business, right? Yeah. And what worked before is not going to be working, say, five years from now, right? Okay. You have to adapt, I mm. think. You know, coming from America and Thailand initially, or maybe even now, did the culture differences shock you in, in any way? You know, like in, in general, Thai people have like a very sabai sabai kind of attitude. Yeah. That's very different to America where, you know, the waiter and waitresses, like sometimes the, the tips is something that they rely on right. to, to make a decent living. Um so did you have any of these shocks or any frustrations? Yeah, the tipping situation is totally different than the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. In the U.S., they, it's common to give 20%, right? And then here, it would be more around the uh, 4 or 5%. Mm -hmm. But there are so many different nationalities that come here. And just like in Italy, they have a bread charge or, you know, uh, France... I, I've seen a certain charge that they do. I think it's called sitting charge or something okay. like that. So, you know, there's so many countries that have different things. And then there's some that don't uh, encourage tipping, right? Yeah. And so we feel that a service charge, as long as it's disclosed, is good, yeah. right? And I think it's fair. Uh, yes, we could increase our prices, right, to to reflect it, right? But I'd rather that, you know, the people know as far as the service charge that that is going for the uh, staff, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the staff really appreciate yeah. it, right? And But it's a set thing. And there's, uh, I mean, that's a very controversial thing mm -hmm. about service charge, for yeah, sure. Cause they just uh, had a ruling on that, in I fact. I was about to ask you regarding that. Yeah. Actually, actually, this morning I was reading an article on, uh, they were ruling on basically the idea of service charge and how uh, some p restaurants even abuse uh, the service charge and that money doesn't even necessarily go to the staff. Right. What, what, how do you feel about those unethical practices? In is it unethical or is it the restaurant's right? You know, as long as it's disclosed, I feel that um, you know, and in, in the staff are taken care of. Yeah. Um, yeah. If everything a hundred percent went into the owner's pocket or anything like that, that's not fair, right? Uh, there are some that do uh, employees' meals, mm -hmm. you know, and they do uniforms and they do uh, housing and they do many other things in lieu of part of the service charge, yeah. right? And, you know, but uh, if you took 100% as a business owner, no, that's not mm -hmm. what the service charge is all about, okay. right? But I've also heard about places that took 100% of people's tips when I thought that's totally wrong, yeah. right? Because yeah. tipping in Thailand in general is a strange concept, right? But a lot of the restaurants don't. A lot of the maybe expat restaurants do. Service charge, that's completely fine. And but yeah. I've actually been refused, uh, you know, maybe on the streets or in different places there. I've tried to tip, 
and and they're like no 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 that's really not necessary please i don't want i don't want your extra money right so it d- depending on that like tipping is just strange in thailand would you say well, here's the whole thing. In order to get English-speaking staff, you're competing. It's very, very hard. It's, yes. a, it's a certain number of people that will work in the restaurant tra- trade and that speak good English. Yeah. And you need those people for the expats. So you're competing against the hotels and the higher-end restaurants that are getting those people and they're getting the service charge. Yes. The staff appreciate it because in the middle of the month, it's like they get a second paycheck, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, that's when we give it out, right? And on the tips, they they handle it themselves 100%, right? Mm. So they get daily tips. And so, you know, at, at the end of the day, you, you, if you didn't do it, it would be hard to get, you know, very good English speaking. Yeah. You know, we're constantly looking for staff, even yeah. though we do it. Right? And is, is it frustrating that most of the times, you know, you do... Uh, as a business owner, lose your best English-speaking staff, you know, in a country where people are, th- there's tourists coming from right. all over the world, English being, you know, spoken so widely, you lose all your staff to hotels who give excellent service charge, especially during the high season, right. you know, these this final quarter of the year when all these people are coming in, you know, and you can't even blame uh, some of the staff because you know that they're going to get a really good salary or really good service charge right. in these five-star hotels. You can't even compete with that. What do you do then? Is that frustrating? It is frustrating. Uh, there was one hotel that used to uh, always nab our staff, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah, the, that's the only way you can compete is mm-hmm. giving a, a good salary that's around that same level because otherwise they're going to nab them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Probably, I always said, hey, you know, at first, the first couple of years, are we the training grounds? You know, are we the... <laughs> I was about to the, say, they probably knew. The minor like, okay, league. Yeah. Sunrise Tacos, American-owned. Yeah. yeah. This, this guy probably There's a certain amount well. of... Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a, a certain standard. I, I know, obviously, you know, with the pandemic, businesses, the way they get operated, everything has changed. But now that, you know, we're coming, Thailand's kind of finally embracing the whole post-pandemic scene do you expect this final quarter or going into the new year are you optimistic that businesses really start picking up i feel i mean i think it already is okay i uh i mean the streets are packed i mean how long does it take to get home now right yeah and uh (laughs) you know it's everywhere you know versus a year or two years ago right and so there's a lot of tourists here and it's just going to get busier when china opens up Wow. And the people are going to be, I mean, they can't wait to go on a holiday. Yeah. And I think the same way with a lot of Europeans. Yes, there's a lot of inflation out there and there's a possible recession, right? Yeah. But people, they want to enjoy life. And so they've been saving up. And, uh, you know, a lot of people talk also about the marijuana. But, uh, yeah, I think that uh, a lot of people are attracted, you know, just like if they're going to uh, Amsterdam, right? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's going to be packed, absolutely yeah. packed. Well, on the note of cannabis in Thailand, as, as a media company, we even found uh, a change in YouTube culture or just media in general. So because when it was part of the on the narcotics list, you couldn't say the word cannabis because the video would get flagged and demonetized. So as an experiment, I ran... I would do a test every week to see if you could say cannabis on air, and now the videos don't get flagged. So now I guess Thailand or YouTube as a, in general has embraced the fact that uh, it's legal here and we can say it. Right. That's my theory anyways. It could be right. something else. But So is that good? More cannabis? More hungry people? More sales in Sunrise Tacos and Margarita Store? Well, we have three locations that are open 24 hours. Oh, okay. Which ones are those? It would be Margarita Storm. It would be Sunrise Tacos at Sukhumvit Soy 33. Okay. And, and then also at Selim Soy 4. So like the, high density areas. Right. Big C okay. on Soy 63 closes at 4 in the morning. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. And they reopen at 11. Okay. So they're almost open 24 hours. But we, you know, we like the late night trout, right? Mm-hmm. So... You know, there's not a lot of competition there, and the people are hungry, and 
Yeah, we do well. Okay. You know? And and how has business been lately? Like how how severely were you impacted with pandemic and how long did it take you to kind of bounce back? Is it still an ongoing process? You know, we survived, obviously, and we held our own. And there was some actual locations that made money. Okay. The ones like uh, at Terminal 21, which is usually number one location, uh, at one time was number 11, right? Uh, simply because there was no tourist, you yeah. know, and nobody dared go into that mall. And uh, now it's popping right up there with one of being one of our best locations, right? Okay, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, business is uh, bouncing back, you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's it, it, times have changed, though. People become a little bit more lazy. They like mm-hmm. to stay home. Yeah. You know? Especially with the traffic now, how yeah. bad it is, yeah. right? What what role do you think the government plays in like the success of a business here in Thailand? Nothing. We'll talk about the restaurants. Nothing. I don't think so. Okay. No. Why would it? I mean, not here in Thailand. Okay. I mean, I, well, as a foreigner, you're never eligible for the loans and stuff. Like they were doing, the uh, they were doing a number of programs. For ties, where it was 50-50, where they would give uh, a subsidized, like if you spent 300 baht, they would give you 150 baht. Okay. So they, I mean, they did try, but that was, you had to be a Thai owner. Okay. And as an American, because I, you know, my company is 100% foreign owned, uh, I was not eligible, right? Mm. And then they also had, as far as loans that you could apply for yeah. if you wanted to, which I didn't have to, but if I wanted yeah. to, I wouldn't have been eligible. So in that regards, but I think as far as for a foreigner being involved here, you know, the governments, they just want their tax okay. money, right? Because, mm. yeah, a lot of people complain about, you know, they'll just say corruption, corruption without really specifying uh, what they actually mean. But, you know, someone who's been in this industry for such a long time running so many restaurants and with that comes the success like do people actually just show up for free things or wanting favors no i mean for a couple years we offered coffee to any policeman that would walk in right but during covid that didn't happen and it's kind of gone by the wayside you know but uh yeah i mean if somebody anybody comes in and say, hey, I don't have any money. Can I uh, eat? We'll take care of them, you know, Mm -hmm. know, even if there are policemen or not a policeman or whatever. Yeah, but that's because it's you. Yeah, right. But but you know what I'm saying? There's nothing, there's no corruption at all about that, right? Okay, fair enough. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good people out. Yeah, and and, uh, that's going to take me to the second part of this uh, podcast. There are a lot of good people out there, you being one of them. Now, oh, thank you. Um, let's talk about uh, briefly, because uh, I plan to do a, more, do a more detailed episode with you in the future with Free So, but Bangkok Community Help Foundation. Now, this was launched in April 9, 2020, uh, operates without a break, and you were helping the people of Bangkok. Uh, you were helping... Thai citizens, uh, people from Burma, migrant workers in camps, outside of camps, under bridges, wherever you could, uh, handing out meals, handing out COVID tests, and helping people who needed the help, basically. And um, but you even- mentioned a number of uh, nationalities, but it actually was worldwide. Uh, even in this year. And the reason why was around March, no, it was more around February, February, March, April, I worked so hard for so many people that were visiting Thailand and they got stuck because they got tested positive with COVID. And maybe they had the COVID before. And so it was huge. Over a thousand people we were able to help where they were going to be going into uh, the hospital and they're going to have a bill of around 80,000. It varied. It was 80,000 baht to 230,000 baht on average. But we were able to uh, explain to them 
you know, what to do to keep out, you know, yeah. because there was, uh, if you had uh, uh, gotten the test before, then if you had a recovery letter and the process and all that. And so there was so much talking to the hospitals and stuff. And so I think probably every country in the world was helped, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. Not China, I don't think, but, yeah. but, you know, at the end of the day, that was pretty pretty exhausting but pretty rewarding mm -hmm. as far as one of the things that we did because yeah. uh, there wasn't a day that wasn't 20 or 30 people that uh, didn't that would have been in the hospital but they were able to stay out right and they needed because they're in a foreign country they didn't speak the language they needed help you know mm -hmm. because they're like what's happening to me you yeah know? so yeah but even before uh banco community uh, help foundation you used to sponsor kids. You right. used to exactly. used to do a lot of charity work. Like, where does this, you know, the need to help people come from? Like, who inspired you to give? I don't know. I think it just comes through your heart, right? Okay. Like it's just how you are. You know, if you care about other people, then uh, it's just the mm -hmm. natural. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. you used to sponsor it about, I think, five kids through yeah. for their education and their right. homes. Yeah. Um, it's the right thing to do, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I wish to me, more it's people like, like you thought that way. <laughs> okay. And you even recently met the governor of Bangkok, Khun Chat Chat, right. doing great things. How does, you know, uh, like, po does politics get involved in running a charity foundation in, in Thailand? Yes and no. I mean, you're not supposed to be uh, influenced by politics, but you definitely work with them as far as logistics. Like, uh, we met uh, Monday with the deputy governor, and he was talking about, hey, we can't do anything about the uh, early development centers where we're giving them 36 baht for the meal, and they get 63 baht a month. Which is nothing, right? Sixty-three month a mm. month for um, a uniform, you know, that they use during the thing. But we can't do anything about the premises, and it's really, really bad premises where these kids are studying mm. because it's not a government building. And can you look into it, you know? And so you need to get. I mean, you can't go in and Google and learn about these particular situations that need help, right? And so. We've uh, worked with a member of parliament, uh, Kun Nong, for uh, a long time where they helped with logistics, but they were not involved. They never donated or anything like that, right? It's the same way with the government. They will never donate, per se, to you, but they'll give you where help is needed. For instance, today we were asking as far as, because we did a lot of sandbags um, last week and the week before, was uh, where these sandbags we need to take today. You know, after our meeting today, we'll be going out and putting, because there's a, expected to be a lot of flooding in the next two or three days. Mm -hmm. So there are eyes and ears, you might say, okay. as far as situations that are developing. All right. And do you see now the government helping the people of Bangkok more so than they did maybe before? I know during the pandemic, uh, you know, you were helping mostly the people who were being neglected right who fell in between the cracks you know a lot a lot of migrant workers and stuff like they, right. they were kind exactly. of left behind no they're are those yeah. people now being taken care of more i wouldn't say so not on the migrant workers uh you know the government just recently they increased for elderly uh from 600 baht a month if you're 60 to 69 years old, they increased it 100 baht, right? And uh, if you're 70 years old, it went like 700 to 800. And if you happen to be lucky to be over 80 years old, you got 800 baht, you got an extra 100. But at the end of the day, you're talking 20 baht or 30 baht. You can't go to the food court these days with 20 or 30 baht and buy a meal, right? Yeah. And so in order for someone to have enough to buy a meal at a food court, they'd have to wait three days, they'd get one meal, right? And so you say, well, the government should give more. Well, just that alone was something like, what was it, four billion baht mm. that 
you know, because there's so many elderly. And Thailand as a whole is an older population, and so it's just going to increase. So it's not like the Western world. Well, the Western world, uh, the, everybody has an issue with social problems, right? Social fun, that there's not enough, you know, when people get older. It's going to run out maybe one day. And so Thailand, there's only so much that it can do, right? Because of its, uh, you know, the tax and the amount of money that they have to give back to the people. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be a politician, right? It's, it's tough. It's yeah. a tough business. A lot of things you can promise, a lot of things you can say, okay, I can do this. But the reality is, where does the money come from? Right? Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I guess, you know, especially not just running restaurants, but especially working in charity, um, you're now basically a public figure, uh, possibly one of the most expat, famous expats in Bangkok. And well, I don't know about that. Who knows? <laughs> Thailand even. No, but not, not only for running successful restaurants, but, you know, Bangkok Community Health Foundation being able to help so many people um, in the city. You've basically helped millions of people in the in in the country by now. How has your life changed on a day to day basis? Like because it it must have been such an instant switch because this really took off uh, early two thousand twenty for you. But I, I I look more at it as I'm the representative. I'm the representative for Sunrise Tacos because oh, believe me. My staff is everything. Without my staff working so hard and being passionate, hey, you know, then it'd be nothing, right? Because your staff can kill you or they yeah. can make you. It's the same way with the volunteers. If it wasn't for the volunteers, Friesel and I would be nothing, right? So we're just the figureheads, right? And so you have to take it as far as it's not your doing. It's because yeah. the community donated and we're just, we're the puppet. We're the puppet behind everything, right? And so, yeah, we're a little bit smart. We work hard, but uh, we represent a lot of people. Yeah. So. Now, after helping all these people, feeding thousands, hundreds of thousands of people again and again, day after day for the last couple of years, you've actually never contracted COVID. Is that true? That's correct, yeah. Neither what did Frieza. special? Yeah, both both you and Frieza. What special immunity do you have that I don't know about? It was funny. We saw an article in the paper, and there was some doctor that said, "If you haven't gotten COVID by now, you don't have no friends." <laughs> pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No, because you're right. But, but the thing is, is yeah. we ran into so many people, and at first, when. You know, I take a picture next yeah, to someone, yeah. right? And they'd get COVID. The whole family had, had COVID. And they would say, oh, they just, t we got did our test the day yeah, before. Yeah. And the results just came back and we got COVID. And everybody would start crying, think I want to die. You know, uh, we're talking the early days, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I had to be isolated and I'd be climbing those dang walls, right? Yeah. But if we only knew what we know now, yeah. right? But, uh at the end of the day, I don't know, maybe it was a hundred times where we dodged the bullets. Yeah. Where Cause we were in a yeah, van, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. uh, eating pizza, mm -hmm. and the guy got COVID that night, right? Yeah. And, and tested, and he says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, you know? And he had been vaccinated yeah. three times, yeah. right? And at the end of the day, we dodged the bullet. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Because you were handing out foods. You know, you oh, were in close so proximity with everyone. Yeah. You've been to the slums. You've been to the migrant work camps. We estimated that it was well over 20,000 people that we were next to in a month. You know, and you're not supposed to, yeah. you know, you're supposed to be more at home, right? Yeah. yeah. It was just incredible numbers that we were next to. Well, Come, yeah. So congrats on whatever yeah, immunity you have. Very Knock on wood. Find and, some and wood. Maybe we had, maybe we had it and we just didn't know. We I were think fortunate. that's most likely to happen. Yeah. I think I think that happened to me as well, most probably. But uh, because yeah, you're it, around so many people, exactly. Right? And at at one point we had a crisis in the office. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was like an empty ghost office because, because everybody had it. Yeah, right? and, and and at that time it was like when you got COVID, you isolate, you're gone for ten days, you don't exist. Right. I mean, yes, some people work from home, depending depending right. on the severity of your. And you're the only man, last man standing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you know, you looked around and everybody was home and yeah, you know. I couldn't afford to get COVID at that time. But there are, they've done some research that there's certain people that just, you know, yeah. it doesn't favor. You know, thank God. True. Yeah. yeah. Now, now watch, we both will yeah. get COVID Yeah, I know, tomorrow, right? Both right? of us. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, but, yeah, that's good. Uh, I thought I found that very interesting. So, so what's next for you and your, you know, I've actually run out of questions, but I'm going to go with really? it. Really? Yes. So I wanted How come? there should be a thousand questions. I wanted right? to keep this unscripted. So I, I wanted okay. to ask you about your initial business and then I wanted to uh, touch briefly about the char- charity. Uh, and I want to keep one episode where we, uh, you know, we join up with free. So and talk okay, in yeah. detail about yeah, the charity, yeah. but where do you see your entrepreneurship going? Do you want to continually invest and have more restaurants? You know, how's what's your goal now in life? Well, I, I don't are, need you, I don't need money. Okay. You know, yeah. I, I I happen to be uh, Thailand's been very good to me, and uh, you know I've been very fortunate in that regards. Uh, you know, we get new things that are brought to us as far as new locations and stuff. I'm very, very selective Mm -hmm. as far as that. But I just want to continue to improve as far as the brand uh, of uh, Sunrise Tacos. You know, if you don't keep on growing, you're going to die, right? Mm -hmm. I I know that I must be in the business. I can't just retire because that's just not my personality, right? I love love it, right? I love winning. I love... Uh, making ha- people happy with the, the food and with the service. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic thing, right? Especially when you do catering and yeah. that sort of thing. One of the things that we do is during the holidays, we give uh, a big turkey or a ham to people's homes. And uh, people, of course, pay for it, right? Yeah. And so... You know, there's usually 12 or 20 people at a person's home. Maybe it's only a family, right, where they don't have to go out to a restaurant and pay a lot more money. And so, in a way, it's so crazy with the traffic and all that where you're trying to deliver a hot meal and you have so many orders, right? And so this is a love-hate relationship. I love it bringing that, but it's so stressful because (laughs) of the logistics, right? And no matter how much you try, there's always going to be one or two houses that didn't get delivered on time. And the people scream and all that, and they think that you're the worst person on human, on the thing. So in a way, I actually dread mm-hmm. these moments coming up because I know it's going to happen. Yeah. But on the other hand, there's so many positive moments. Yeah. But that's the only downside to, uh, you know, because I usually don't get too many complaints, right? Yeah. But it, it, it's unbearable when you try to help so many people. And then, then the night before the big event on either Thanksgiving or Christmas, people are always begging because you're, you know, you say, the s- ovens are going to be full. I'm limiting it to 200 people that we can, 200, when I'm saying 200 people, that's 200 families. So it's actually 1,200 people we're feeding that day, right? Yeah. So, please, 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 you know, and you invariably those yeah. are the ones that there's a, a issue with the next day, you mm. know, but uh, yeah, you know, just to talk about it, it's not always roses when it comes to entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, I'm fortunate that we have a fantastic staff, but, you know, when the restaurants are still going, but we're still doing this above and beyond, right? Yeah. God help us, our staffs, they're fantastic, right? So, but, uh, I, you know, it's expanding. I'm not going to do anything for the next couple months because of uh, uh, because we have the big holidays coming up. But after that, you know, if if there is a good re- location or whatever, I'm always looking to okay. to expand. You know. Yeah, Greg, if you don't mind, could you would you be willing to share perhaps one of your failures that you know. Uh, helped you to get to this point it could you know w- maybe when you were starting off in thailand during between uh, did you face any failures or has have you just been you know you mean luck financially has... it could be anything it could be financially it could be uh, with staff it could be getting something going it could be you know one of the things that i had a hard time because i'm a perfectionist was if something's not going right uh and I told someone uh, something five times or 
you know, I thought this might be an issue. And so I told him four or five times, hey, watch out for this. Yeah. And that still went wrong the next day after yeah. I think, well, I had a very hard time coping <laughs> with that, right? Uh, and the thing is, is that's, that if that's you... That's what I meant by sabai, sabai style. Right, exactly. You have to... You have to bite your tongue. But how could I bite my tongue when yeah. I, I said, did you understand, right? And they say, ka or ka, ka. But then it was explained to me, when they're saying ka or ka, that doesn't mean that they understand. Are, they understand. Yeah. They're just listening to you. They're telling you, I, I hear what you're saying. It doesn't mean that I'm going to do it. <laughs> 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 and it was like, yeah. what? Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it was mind boggling because then the people would always look at me. Like I said, the staff can, can make you look like a hero or they can kill you, right? Yeah. But the, the foreigner would look at me, the guest. So I told you, uh, what am I supposed to do? Say, well, I told my staff and they, you know, it just makes you look terrible, right? Yeah. And, and you, you wanted everything to be perfect. You did everything to your ability. Yeah, but, uh, if you don't do it the right way, that staff is just going to quit. Yeah. And so now you, you, you lost the guest that's not happy, and you lost maybe a, a good staff, right? So how and do so, you make your way around that? I still haven't figured it out, but I just don't get as angry. <laughs> I, I agree with you that most people, they come to Thailand with their agenda, and then they, they shape themselves around their staff. Um, so... I, I feel your pain. We had actually, you know, um, uh, we had a f uh, f former French uh, Michelin star chef. He used to be the chef of Mandarin Oriental. He now runs a French bakery called Foley's. Uh, and he was talking about how, you know, he's from... Uh, He's from France. He was trained in traditional French cuisine. If you make a mistake, you're basically, you know, oh, yeah. you're, you're, you're hammered. And he, when he came here, and he just, the amount of patience he never thought he had and just dealing with stuff. Because they're right, like running a business in Thailand is also accepting the fact that you're in Thailand. Things here are done in a certain way. Thai people are very emotional. They, yeah. If they love you, they'll do anything for you. Right. You know, they'll go to war for you. They'll, but... It could be the simplest thing in the world that could upset them. Or, and, you know, you know they, can walk, they can walk, put their apron down and mm. just walk next exactly. door. Exactly. Yeah. It is so easy to, I mean, now because COVID is uh, hopefully over, yeah. that is so easy to find another job. Yeah. Well, especially now, everybody's begging for people to come in and work for them, right? Mm. And so, yeah, you have to, you know, there's a certain amount of respect, you know, for your staff. And uh, yeah, yeah I, that's that's the try the, the the pain you might say. Mm. And one of the things when I I sold the business brokerage, by the way, about four or five years ago. Thank okay. God, right before COVID. But uh, one of the big things a lot of people know me about with uh, with that was I started a law firm because there wasn't at that time a lot of uh, expats that uh, were getting. Uh, cheap rates for work permits or for visa for company setups. Everything was very, very high back in 2001. And so I introduced that. And so the rates came way, way down. Oh, okay. And so we, you know, that's probably one of the biggest ways that I made money was through the legal Okay. Uh, legal arena. So, so in, and indirectly, we you did become a lawyer. Yeah, that's absolutely nice. True. We had over 70 people okay. working. Uh, and so, yeah. At the, I don't know where I was going on that, but <laughs> <laughs> but but at the end of the day, yeah. uh, one of the people that uh, I was talking to said, you know, listen, I'm tying. Yeah. And if I'm talking to one of my staff and I tell them, thank, it's proper, but you're a foreigner. If you use the same language, they're going to go to the toilet. They're going to cry and all that. Yeah. There's a difference there. Yes. And there is. You have to be a little more softer, a little more. You have kind. to be much more softer. Yeah. So there is kind of a dis kind of a disadvantage. You can't say what's on your mind. Yeah. If you're a foreigner, you just mm. have to. Sabai, sabai, my pen rai, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Smile. My pen rai, sabai, <laughs> sabai. Okay. How do you think, uh, you know, working in Thailand and you know, Sunrise Tacos, kind of having that Mexican food, you know, you're an American entrepreneur. Do you feel like American culture has 
been adopted by Thailand in general or, you know, Thai locals? What do you think the relationship is between American culture and Thailand? Is it a, can you come from America, move to Thailand and swiftly just fit in or it's a big learning curve? You know, I think the best thing is just to have patience and understand not to, you know, there are some foreigners that talk very, very quiet and they're perfect, mm -hmm. right? And they have that ability to learn the language and uh, they fit right in, right? But, you know, Americans usually have that reputation of being loud and, <laughs> uh, you know, some of us really? want to be perfectionists, right? <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, you, you, those Americans have to tone it down, right? Okay, yeah. And uh, they have to be respectful, you know? And yeah. so, yeah, if you, if you don't, that staff that you took such a hard time to recruit to come and work for you is just not going to be working for you anymore, mm. right? And and the, the sad thing is sometimes that even if you did spend a lot of time to recruit them and everything's good, sometimes if there's a better opportunity, oh yeah, if it's it just immediately more. yeah, right. five hundred baht more. And th that's what I was that's where I was going with this. I, I I've seen this happen. I've experienced it. I've had other colleagues and. Uh, business entrepreneurs who say this like for 500 baht more they're willing to uproot what they've spent a year maybe making to go and work across the street right or they got a big bonus at the end of the year or they went on uh, trips and all that where i've seen business owners where they treat the staff and they take them on holiday and they go everything they extra mile but then if somebody offered someone 500 baht more that went all the way because that was the past. Yeah. Right? It didn't really matter. But, you know, it's just because you, you talk to other business owners and everybody has where they think the right way. Well, I haven't figured it out yet. No. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say, yeah. you know, being here 21 years that I can say, okay, well, this is exactly what you have to do. Yeah. You know, as far as, you know, giving a, a bonus or giving that. It doesn't seem to really help at the end of the day if someone's going to get the 500 baht. The most important thing is to sit down with the person and hopefully you've you built up a relationship with them where, uh, yeah, that's that's the only thing that would work is having the relationship where they come to you or, you know, and, and you're taking care of them anyway, right? But mm. everybody, especially now, want to... The reason they leave a job to go to another thing is because they want to get a higher salary or they want to advance their career, right? They use it as a stepping stone, mm -hmm. why they move so much. It's, uh, you know, as far as the restaurant business, it's hard to keep your staff because a lot of the times they have dinner on a Sunday, let's say, right? And so all the relatives are in that and they says, hey, where's Susie at? Oh, she's working. Now, if she says she's working for a five-star hotel, that's, oh, okay, great. Especially if Susie has gotten a college education and speaks English, right? But if she's working for a restaurant, she went to college to become a waitress, right? But it didn't matter how much money she was making if she's making 25,000 baht. But the same person could be a paralegal. Oh, what does Susie do? Oh, She's a paralegal at a law firm, right? Oh, okay, good. You know, uh, she's growing, right? Or she's a lawyer. Uh, at the end of the day, the salary could have been half. It didn't matter because it's all about um, Where is this going to take me? Yeah. yeah. It, it's all about the respect. So it's very hard. They have a lot of pressure from the family to not be in the restaurant business or to be working for the five-star hotels. There's yeah. so much more prestige. Yeah. And so, so it's uh, it, it, that you're constantly fighting that. Yeah. You know, how do you get that mentality shift here in Thailand then? How do you get people to see the bigger picture? You just build up relationships, right? Is that they know and they trust you and they'll die for you. Like you said yeah. before, that you know, uh, uh, certain people, you've built up relationships and they'll do anything for you. They have to do that. When we're, you know, it's 48 hour. And I, when I'm not exaggerating, when I say 48 hours, 48 hours of nonstop work at Christmas Eve to Christmas Day, 
on three or four of the cooks or the chefs. Mm. I mean, that's inhuman, right? Yeah. But I'm there also, right? And you can't move, right? And people are screaming because they want their food, right? So, you know, why? And then I always question, why do I do this to myself? You know, why every year, right? Mm -hmm. Why did I not say no, yeah. right? Uh, so, but that that is because of love love for the brand and love to do well right mm -hmm. and they want to make money you know so it, there's not too many people like that though okay but but at the end of the day it's all about relationships it is entrepreneurship here it is because the staff really is what it, it, when i asked people when they wanted to sell their business i would always ask them a question uh what was the hardest thing for your business and they'd all would say staff. I think it was 100 out of 100. I, I don't remember even if it was 99 out of 100, but it seemed like I always would hear that the, the staff, it was very hard to keep staff, or it was very hard to keep uh, the staff happy, you know, and uh, they had to build up the relationships, but that's the hardest part of, uh, uh, of uh, doing business in Thailand. So, but if you can conquer that, uh, there's no real, yeah. There's no, nothing written on stone how to do it, yeah. you know, except build that relationship. And every person is different, right? Mm. So. Okay. Greg, what's the one piece of advice you've give, you'd give to someone wanting to come to Thailand and starting their own business empire? Let's say start with a restaurant. So one entrepreneurial advice for a person wanting to, come, wanting to come to Thailand and start a restaurant? Definitely don't uh, start it from scratch. You should uh, find a successful re uh, restaurant that is selling for uh, human reasons, such as a partnership dispute or um, divorce or retirement. You can't go into a successful restaurant and say, how much do you want to sell? Because that person most likely will never be happy to sell because if you offered him five million baht, then all of his friends would say, what are you going to do after two or three years? That five million is gone, right? Mm. Then he'll want 10 million. And it's going to be very, very hard to close that particular deal. But if someone has a human reason why they want to sell health reasons or retirement, then... And it's a uh, successful business. You can see that, it, that it's working. That's fantastic because the odds of you succeeding is very, very high, probably over 90%. There's a number of restaurants that are for sale simply because they're not losing, you know, they're not making money. They're going to say, oh, they have other business interests. Uh, okay, what's your other business interest? I'm interested in that, right? Uh, you don't want to, you know, unless it's a great location and you have a great concept, that would be the only time that you would, be entertaining to take over something that was, uh, a, you know, a, a dead, yeah. dead location. But if something's successful, then it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, sure, you have to probably work for a couple of years for free because that money, the profit is going to go back and pay the uh, previous owner. But guess what? After two or three years, you now have the business and he still had to maintain his lifestyle, and all that money that he's gotten in the last two or three years is gone out of the bank because he had to maintain his lifestyle, and he doesn't have a business anymore. Mm. So who's the true winner in the situation? It's the person with the business because it's like a, a golden goose, right? And so, yeah. Why, why would you suggest not to start a restaurant business from the scratch? The failure, the to, risk is too much. Well, because you don't. it's very, very hard to get a location and then – most everybody would never be able to be able to handle the construction. You know, the uh, uh, construction is pretty much a nightmare right at first. Even, even uh, for me, after 20 years, you know, there's still things that I learn. But uh, having something that's up and going, that has the furniture, that has the, you know, you're, you're doing this all probably because you don't speak Thai as well. So everything's already made for you, the menus, the... Uh, I mean, there is a million things that involved as far as buying uh, uh, supplies and all that. And all of that is already provided. This is what we, where we buy this from. This is where we buy. It's either that or buying a franchise. You need to have 
a proven business model to put the odds on your side. Because now all of a sudden, you think that you're, you're selling sandwiches better than someone else, so you open Susie's Sandwich, right? Who the heck is Susie's Sandwich, right? So most likely, that taste is going to be different than what other people are used to, right? Yeah. There's not too many, and times have changed also. What might have been a really big success say 20 years ago, because there wasn't much competition, uh, is different than now. Now there's a lot of pizza places, there's a lot of sandwich places, a lot of ja Japanese places. You know, there's not too much not, that's not competition. There's even hot dog places now. Mm -hmm. So what niche is there? And then that niche, Peruvian, <laughs> how many people are going to eat that, right? Okay. You know, so if you get something that's, uh, that is really is selling because of emotion reason, then maybe you can take yeah. that and now you've got everything lined up and then you can expand your business into, you know, a second and third and fourth and fifth location. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's how I guess KFC started or McDonald's, right? Is they took yeah. something that was a, a proven business model and then they expanded from there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Greg, for... Oh. Coming on good talking podcast. to you. Yeah. No more questions, huh? No more questions <laughs> yet. Yeah, but uh, thank you for coming onto the podcast and answering um, a few questions about entrepreneurship, a few questions about running a business in Thailand, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do another part two uh, in the right. future. Yeah, I think uh, let's end it up as far as uh, if you want to be successful here. I guess there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, potential demons, you might say, with the uh, cannabis and with uh you know always with the uh go go bars and stuff like that because i've seen a lot of uh business owners lose focus right and so just keep your eye on the ball and uh it's not over after you know everybody's motivated the first 90 days yeah you know 90 days is nothing it's two years three years four years five years because you have the golden goose at that time and the goose can die if you don't take care of it Goose can die. Take care of it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Greg. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs>